welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, hey, listen, I'm going to go before the Lord and I'm going to get down on my knees and go before the Lord in prayer. I need prayer. We need prayer. And hey, listen, we didn't come to, hear this, to, come to this place to hear from a man, from a tall man, an old man, a young man, a white man, a black man, uh, uh, whatever it might be. We came into this place to hear from God. So I'm going to pray and I'm going to get down on my knees that the Holy Spirit speak to us. And so if you're able to stand, would you join me and and stand as we go before the Lord in prayer? Father, we come before you in this place, Lord, and we are grateful for the opportunity that we have to come into the house of the Lord. Father, your word tells us that I was glad. It says, I was glad, the psalmist says, when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Father, why? Because that's where your presence is. Lord, your word says that when two or more are gathered together, there you are in the midst. And so, Father, we know right now that you are here in the midst of us. And, Lord, we don't come into this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. Lord, we don't come to church to find entertainment. But, Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And Lord, we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. So Lord, in the name of Jesus, I ask that your Holy Spirit speak to us, minister to us, show us things to, uh, that, that you've showed us before, bring things to remembrance, show us the, uh, the, the, the revelation of your word today. Lord, I pray that it would be a seed planted in the, in, the, in the ground of our hearts, Lord, that it would bear much fruit, God, that we would grow to maturity as Christians and as the church, the body of Christ. Lord, the blessings that we ask upon ourselves, we don't ask upon Jesus just ourselves, but Lord, upon all the brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Lord, we don't see ourselves as better than anybody else, but truly as co-laborers in the body of Christ, all working together to serve in the ministry. So Father, with that, we ask that you bless our Catholic brothers and sisters, our Methodist, Baptist, Episcopalian, and Lutheran, and ba- uh, Lutheran brothers and sisters, and our Presbyterian brothers and sisters. Lord, I thank you for all the churches across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ this week. Lord, we lift up Harvest and the Grove and Sandals and, and Trinity. Father, we lift up a man Annual Baptist and Ecclesia. God, we lift up Oak Valley to you and Crossroads and all the churches, too many to name. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters at the Rock Church of South Riverside. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters at the Rock Church in Coachella Valley. Lord, we thank you for our brothers and sisters at the Rock Church in Temecula and Pastor David and our brothers and sisters at the Rock Church of Coastal Hills in San Diego. Lord, we thank you that we are all many members of one body that is the body of Christ. Come together to hear, to serve, and to grow in the ministry, and to grow in the kingdom of God. In Jesus' mighty name, and we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, as you're being seated, go ahead and get your Bibles out. I'm excited for what God's got in store. If you got your Bibles with me, turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. We're going to pick up on what we talked about last week. Part number two, the title of tonight's message, Where is the fight? Where's the fight? Now, if you were here last week, was anybody here last week? Let me see who, so just so, oh, look at you guys. Man, consistency, right on. We talked about where's the fight. You know, you you think about back in the day. We talked about this last week, back in the day when you were in school. Some of you don't even remember when you were in school, but you know how it goes. Somebody yells the word fight, and everybody's there. That was a thing to do at recess. And we always want to go, and we always want to find the fight. But the question wasn't where do we go, where do we go to see a fight? But rather, where's the fight in us? Where's the fight in us, the body of Christ? So last week we talked about the fight within or the fight of the flesh, speaking of two different fights that you and I face, Paul the Apostle. Last week out of Romans said that he realized that there was a war going on between his spirit and his body and that he would do things that he didn't want to do and the things that he wanted to do, he didn't do. So last week we talked about the fight of the flesh. And this week we're going to continue... But now we're going to move to the second fight. Now, I wish we had time to talk about this. I wish we had time to discuss this. Books, volumes have been written on both the fight of the flesh and the fight of the spirit. But for today's sake, we have to kind of overview and just touch on some certain things that the Lord has pressed upon my heart to talk about and things that I've seen and read in the Word of God and things that I've experienced for myself as well as uh, with the uh, advice and the, the leadership of Pastor Jim and Pastor Deborah. And so I'm excited for what God's got. We're talking about where's the fight. And I had you turn to 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians in the third chapter, Paul the Apostle again is writing. We read from Paul's uh, writings last week. And now we find ourselves Paul writing, find ourselves reading Paul writing to the church in Corinth in verse number 3. 2 Corinthians in the 10th chapter. Paul says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So you and I live this life in our bodies. You and I live this life 
out as though, uh, as, as people. In, 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 mis, in mis, unmistakable, inescapable fact. We can't deny that. We walk according to the flesh. We live in these bodies. We live in this world. But here he says an interesting statement. We do not war or we do not fight according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Now that word carnal means fleshly, physical. Now, for, uh, for those of you who speak Spanish, you know that carne means meat, right? Chili con carne. <laughs> so for those of you who are white, just think of it like that. The weapons of our warfare are not carne. <laughs> Carnal. They're not physical. The weapons of our warfare, meaning the fights that you and I go through, the fight of faith, the, the spiritual battles that we're going to go through, physical weapons have no use. Now, there's a big movement on two complete the opposite sides of the spectrum in the United States, those who are buying as many guns as they possibly can, and those who are fighting to get the people that are buying as many guns as they possibly can to get them to not buy guns anymore. Two complete opposite ends of the spectrum. But the reality is it doesn't matter how many guns you own or how many guns you don't own. It doesn't matter what you got. It doesn't matter if you got a knife or a, or a, kitchen, uh, a kitchen butter knife as your home defense. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, meaning whatever you grab that's physical ain't going to do nothing in the battle, in the spirit. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. We're going to see a little bit about strongholds tonight. For pulling down strongholds. They're mighty in God. So here Paul's saying, listen, whatever it is that's physical doesn't matter, but doesn't, because they're not physical doesn't mean they're not strong. Just because it's not a physical fight doesn't mean it's not a, a, a ferocious fight. Just because it's not a physical fight doesn't mean that it's not a lasting fight. But rather, the weapons of our warfare are mighty in God. The weapons of our warfare are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. A lot being said in these few verses. And here Paul says, the weapons that we fight, the way in which we fight the, the battles of life, the way in which we fight in the spirit is not the way that we fight in the flesh, but the weapons that we have are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, strongholds being things that are hard to get into. You think back in the days of castles and moats and, and high walls, those were strongholds, military strongholds that would, that would resist the barrage or resist the continual buffeting of somebody trying to penetrate that stronghold to get in. Strongholds in our life can be anything from drinking, from lust, from cursing, from complacency, from things of the flesh. Strongholds in our life could be anything that would take our eyes away from the sight of Jesus Christ and fix our eyes on the things that we want rather than what God wants. And they are mighty in pulling down, not just in breaking through, mind you, but in pulling down, in destroying, in laying waste to strongholds. Meaning the things that you struggled with through the power of God, you don't have to struggle with. Meaning that the passage you came from, the drugs and the alcohol and the sex and the perversion and the lies and the, and the stealing and the cheating that we as humans love to see and experience, they're not a struggle. Why? Because they're mighty in God in pulling them down, in laying waste and leaving that to rubble. Amen. And now we build a foundation on Jesus Christ, our chief cornerstone, taking every thought into captivity, We'll talk about that in a little bit. So today we're going to talk about the weapons. He says, although we walk according to the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. There is a spiritual fight. Listen, regardless if you believe it, regardless if you want to admit it or not, there is things at play right now, right now, in your and my life that you and I can't see. There is a spiritual realm. There is a spiritual force out there that wants to do some things to you. And we're going to talk about them. There is a spiritual fight. And the title of today's message is Where's the Fight? 
Because we're going to, by, hopefully by the end of tonight, you and I are going to realize that we got to stand up and fight. Amen. That we as a church, we as the church, the people of God, have got to stand up and fight. If anything, we realized that safety is not promised in our day and age. You could go anywhere and in the most random moment of life, Life can happen. Safety is not promised, but let me tell you something. What is? Security in Jesus Christ. Security in Jesus Christ. And there is a fight out to take your soul. There is a fight for your life that you're going to have to do. You're going to have to battle for it. But thank God we don't do it alone. Amen? So as we get in tonight's message, there's a spiritual fight that we're going to talk about. Some things that we need to discuss we need to know about the devil. You and I need to know about Satan. Sometimes we get so focused in on God, we get so focused in on love, and we get so focused in on faith and finances and prosperity and healing that we don't focus in on the battle. And we get into this kind of euphoric relationship or this utopia of, of Christianity where we kind of neglect the fact that there is a darkness out there, not just in society, not just from the, the form of the world, but there is a darkness led by Satan that is out to destroy you and I. Regardless if you believe it or not, regardless if you, whenever you hear the word devil or Satan, you think of the little cartoon character with the red horns and the pitchfork sitting on one side of the shoulder while the, the little angel is, and listen, there's a whole different idea that you and I have got to have a grasp of reality. And as a matter of fact, when the Bible addresses the situation and the, and the, and the teachings and the, and, the, and the thoughts about Satan, they are very concise, very clear. Which means that you and I need to take it serious. That you and I need to understand that we have an adversary. The devil. And we need to know about him. Doesn't mean that we have to study and have to read the books and all that thing. Because you know what? The Bible gives us everything we need to know about the devil. Are you with me today? We have everything we need to know about our enemy written in the book. The great book. In 2 Timothy, the second chapter, I'll put it up on the overhead in the New Living Translation. Paul encourages the young Timothy and he says, endure suffering along with me as a soldier in Christ. You and I, when we came into the body of Christ, the Bible says that we were adopted as sons. That we are heirs and co-heirs into the body of Christ. But did you know that along with being heirs and co-heirs and sons and daughters of the living God, did you know that you and I are enlisted as soldiers in God's army? You and I are enlisted as soldiers in God's army. we got to shape up. Get ready. Because there's a fight coming. Some of you are already in it. Some of you have gone through it. But let me tell you something. It ain't over yet. And so he says, endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Verse number four goes on to say, soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life. For they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. When you're in battle, when you're in, the, in, a, in a firefight, you're not worried about what Oprah said on TV. When you're in a fight for your life, you're not worried about what's going on with Brad and Angelina. You are worried about what's going on in the fight. And Paul tells the young Timothy to endure as a soldier. Don't be caught up in everything around you, but look into the fight and find out about what's going on. Did you know? You don't go into a fight not knowing about your enemy. You don't go into a fight not knowing about your opposition. When, they, when you look at, at sports and boxing and, 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 and combat fights, things that mix martial arts or anything of that nature that requires wrestling, they know their opponents. They watch the tapes. They've watched the, 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 the fights back. They know their strengths. They know their weaknesses. In the military... They know their opponents. That's why governments spend countless amounts of money on intelligence. So they can gather everything that they know so that when they go into a fight, they know exactly what they're getting into. And as Christians, you and I, as soldiers in God's army, we have got to make it a point for you and I to get involved in the fight and to know about our adversary. To know who we're fighting. To know what we're fighting. And to know 
how to fight it. It's incredible. It's in crucial. It's crucial for you and I to grab a hold of this. So some things that we have got to know about the, about the devil. Some things, and then we'll talk about the spiritual fight. Some things we know based on the word of God. Listen, we know that the devil has no desire for us to be happy. Oh, but Pastor Luke, back when, before I was a Christian and the drinking and the, and the smoking and all the stuff that I was doing, man, we had fun. The world just has fun. It's so much fun. And listen, let me tell you something. The devil is not out there to be like your DJ. He's not out there to be your party host. He's not out there to lead you in a good time. The fact of the matter is, Satan has zero desire for you to be happy. Zero desire for you to be happy. Zero desire for you to be happy. As a matter of fact, Jesus tells us in John the 10th chapter that the thief, speaking of Satan, does not come except, listen, the only reason he's going to show up at your door is to steal, kill, and destroy you. To steal from you, to, to kill you, and destroy you. He's not showing up with a six-pack saying, let me in, let's have a good time. He's showing up for a fight. And you and I got to understand that there is no happiness that comes from him. None. Jesus Christ says in John the 8th chapter, 44th verse, I don't have it on the overhead, you don't have to say anything, that, that Satan is the original liar, the father of lies and the first murderer. He is not out for your benefit. Some things we know about the devil. We know that the devil wants nothing more than our destruction. He hates you. You say, Pastor Luke, what did I do? What did I do? I ain't done nothing. Why does he hate me? Can we all get along? He hates you. He hates you. He wants nothing, church, but your destruction. He wants nothing. Listen, he doesn't want to just make your life. We get this picture. We get this picture of the devil like we talked about just a second ago, this little red, red, red horned little devil looking thing with a pitchfork. And we laugh and say, oh, he comes to poke us and jab at us with his little pitchfork and just bug us and annoy us. Let me tell you something. Devil is not out to pester you. He's not like a little house fly. That comes to bug you. He's not like a little little gnat that gets in your ear on a hot day. Just, ah, just leave me alone. He's not out to bug you. He's out to destroy you. He's out to see you miserable. He's out to see every waking moment of your life miserable. That is his mission. The Bible tells us, 1 Peter 5.8, I'll put it up on the overhead. Peter speaking this. He says, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Not a roaring lion seeking who he's going to lick, like gentle Ben. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. He's going to eat you up. We've talked about this before. You know how lions hunt. You've seen the Lion King. They get down in the grass. They go after the sick, sick and the weak. They go after the inattentive and they sneak up, not in front of them. No, 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 no. They sneak up behind them. What, right? They jump on them. They chase them down and they hunt in groups. They don't walk around drooling all over themselves. Hey, get over here. Uh-uh. He says the devil walks around like a roaring lion. You know what that means? He's crawling in the grass right next to you. That means that his, the forces of darkness are out there waiting to jump on your back, waiting to come at you, waiting to get you down and out, waiting for the moment and weakness in your life to pounce. He is out to destroy you. That's a warning from Peter. You know Peter firsthand experienced the attacks of the enemy? Jesus himself told Peter, he said, Peter, Satan is asked to sift you like wheat. Satan is asked that he could take you out. But I have prayed that God would keep you. Peter got himself involved in vanity, arguing about who's the greatest, 
Peter's the one that got himself in lies denying Jesus Christ. Peter got himself in all sorts of traps and snares of the enemy. And here, now towards the end of his life, he begins to warn the church saying, I have been there. And he don't want any good for you except to destroy you. You've got to be sober. You've got to be vigilant. We know that the devil wants nothing more than our destruction. Something else? We know that the devil knows if he can get our mind, he can get our life. If he can get our mind, he can get our lives. Starting from the very first example that you and I see the encounter of Satan as he speaks to Eve in the garden. He knows. He doesn't have to show up with, with uh, swords and hands and, and, and big axes and big intimidating weapons that are carnal. All he had to do was plant an idea. All he had to do was plant an idea and get Eve to believe that she wouldn't die but that she would really see things the way God sees things. You see, the Bible goes on and talks about Satan. It tells us that he was uh, uh, perfect in beauty. He was a beautiful creature. But you know, the reality is, is the Bible says that man was designed in the image of God. So from the get-go, Satan, when he exalted himself and wanted to be like God, was jealous of you and I because we were created in the image of that that he wanted to be like. And if he can get your mind, he can get your life. If he can get you to buy the lie, he can get you to die. He's after your mind. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians in the fourth chapter, verse number three, but even our gospel is veiled, Paul speaking to the church in Corinth. It's veiled to those who are perishing, to those who are dying, whose minds the God of this age, speaking of Satan, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them, saying the devil has blinded the minds of people so that they would not believe the word of God. If he can get your mind, he can get your soul. There ain't no other way to get saved. There's no other way to find ourselves in heaven. And if he can get you to buy into, well, if I can be a good person, eh, he's got you. If he can get you to buy into, say, well, God's a God of, of mercy and he'll let everybody in no matter what because God's not that kind of a God. Guess what? He's got you. He's blinded the minds of the people. We know that the devil knows if he can get our mind, he can get our life. Are you with me today? We know that the devil fights from a defeated position. We know that the devil fights from a defeated position. You know what that is? That's a position of desperation. Oftentimes I've wondered, why fight if you know you're beat? Why? You know you're beat. Why go after the people? And then I looked it up. A military tactic. I saw it when I was watching an old World War II movie, and I wondered why did they do it. Military tactic used in battle called scorched earth. Scorched earth tactic. You might remember in the images of the Gulf War decades ago, the oil fields of Kuwait on fire as they retreated. They set them on fire so that the United States could not use the oil for their advancement. In Germany and in Russia in the Second World War, Hitler and Stalin destroyed their own buildings, their own military strongholds, their own resources and their own supplies on the retreat from a defeated position so that the advancement of the enemy could not use their weapons and their strongholds and their supplies against them. You see, the devil so hates you and is so bent on your and my destruction that he's not fighting because he wants to pester us. He's fighting because he doesn't want you to succeed. If he's going to fail, he wants to take as many with him as he can. And he's fighting from a stance of desperation. And we've got to know our enemy. We've got to understand why he fights, how he fights, what he's after, what his motives are. Understand the seriousness and the severity of this so that we can come back and we can understand how to fight, who we're fighting for, and who is on our side. It's quiet because we're talking about what the devil... Nobody wants to hear that somebody hates them. That breaks my heart.
to know that here I am, I didn't do anything. And he hates me and he wants me dead. What did I do? That's hard for us to get. That's hard. So I know why you're quiet, because nobody wants to hear that. But let me tell you something. We're not ending tonight on that. We're ending tonight on fighting the fight. Now we know. Now we know the seriousness that there's somebody out there bent on your destruction. There's somebody out there that wants to take from you, wants to take your kids, your kids' kids, everything that you've owned, everything that you can see, everything that you can touch, and wants to destroy it just for his own. But now let's talk about the spiritual fight because we got a fight on our hands. We got a fight on our hands, church. Let me tell you something. Let it be good news to you and I that the de devil is fighting from a defeated position. Why? Because he already knows what's going to happen. All you and I have got to do is hold off until Jesus comes and shows the devil a thing or two about justice. Don't worry. His justice is coming. He's not going before a, a biased court or an unbiased court. He's not worried about, you know, having to live in a prison cell for the rest of his life and having, you know, food and entertainment and, and exercise and, and all, that, all those things that, you know, some people might get. He's not worried about that. The Bible tells us what's, what's going on with the devil. He's going to be cast into the lake of fire for eternity. It's only a matter of time. And we got a fight on our hands. And it's our decision whether or not we're going to fight it or we're going to let it go. It's our decision, church, whether we're going to fight or we're going to let it go. But we have a spiritual fight on our hands. Luke, the 10th chapter, verse number 17 says, Then the 17 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Jesus had sent his disciples out with no money, with no clothes, with nothing. He said, you go out there and the Lord will provide. And they went out there and they preached the gospel and they cast out demons. And now they're coming back with a report saying, Jesus, everything you said was true. You couldn't believe it. We said things and the demons, they were subject to us in your name. Amazing. These things that had us in bondage, these things that had us tormented, these things that had us running for our lives. Now all of a sudden all we had to do was speak. And they're subject to us and they were excited about that. And look what Jesus says in verse number 18. He goes on to say, he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. You know what he just, <laughs> that's a heavy subject. That's a, what Jesus Christ, you know what Jesus is saying? I was there. The great fights of boxing, the great sports in the World Series, people, man, I was at game seven. I was out there in the 13th round. Jesus says, I was there. I saw him fall. I don't know about you. Has anybody ever seen lightning? Anybody ever seen lightning? Let me see your hand if you've seen lightning. Just wave at me if you've seen lightning before. Lightning don't move slow. It doesn't meander. Boom! It's like that. And Jesus says, man, I saw Satan fall, and he hit the ground hard. He hit the ground hard. The fight's on. The fight's on. And he's already been knocked down. He's already been punched in the chin once. Now all you and I got to do is close it up, finish the fight, keep on pushing, keep on swinging, keep on fighting, keep on praying. Ain't going to let no devil run over my life. Ain't going to let no devil have control over my family. Ain't going to let no devil have control over my finances. Ain't going to let no devil have control over my city. I'm going to fight. You gonna fight? Where's the fight? Let's talk about how to fight. You wanna know how to fight? You wanna get some fighting lessons? Come on, man, let's do this. I'm fired up. The devil, he's fighting from a defeated position. So then how do we fight this spiritual battle? Three easy things. Well, they say they sound easy. 
comes to, when it comes time to put them in place, that's the real test. But here we'll talk about them tonight. How do we fight these spiritual battles? Well, I'm going to say a word or a phrase, and then we're going to finish it. The phrase is, we fight, and we'll finish it three ways. Number one tonight, how do we fight these spiritual battles? We fight in faith. It's a supernatural battle. It's a supernatural battle. It doesn't make sense to the intellect. He said, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God. You see, you and I, we live in a day and age of modern weapons. We live in a day and age of drones and B-2 bombers and nuclear war. And then that's not going to make any difference in a spiritual battle. It doesn't make any difference. It's a supernatural battle. And we fight the fight in faith. We fight the fight in faith. The Bible tells us that God doesn't give us temptations that are uncommon to man. Meaning the things that the enemy is going to come after you with, you're going to have dealt with them. Your fellow mankind is going to have to, you're not going to go through something that nobody else has never gone through before. You're going to, you have somebody on your side. And the fact is, is the Bible tells us that whatever you and I have been delivered, whatever the enemy comes at you, God will give you the out for it. God will give you the battle plan for it. God will give you the way to get through it. But you have got to fight and you have got to believe that God is there, even though it seems sometimes in the fight like he may not be. It's a fight of faith. Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter, verse number 12, Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. When you don't think you can fight, fight the good fight of faith. When you think that you've been knocked down and you're ready to, you're down for the count, fight the good fight of faith. Why? Because it's not about you getting up last week. Remember, we talked about it. Rely on God's grace. Why? Because His grace is sufficient. When you get knocked down, the fight of faith gets on your side and picks you back up. And you get up swinging. Fight the good fight of faith. Don't settle for what the enemy has for you. Don't settle that you are the way you are. Don't settle that this is as good as it's ever going to get. Because if he can get your mind, he'll get your soul. Don't settle, but have a fight of faith. Don't give up on it either. Fight the good fight of faith. In Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Go with me to Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Let's turn to some pages in our Bible instead of me putting them up on the overhead for you all. Make you work for it. Turn them pages. Ephesians, the sixth chapter. You with me tonight? Yeah. Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Verse number 12. 612. Common verse. We know this. I'm not going to read it all. You can read it later. Here he says, For we fight, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, in the places that you and I can't even see. And there he says, as a warning and admonition, he says, therefore, because our fight is not physical, take up the whole armor of God. Take up the whole armor of God. Don't just put a little bit on. Don't go, put a, don't go to, the, to the gun store or to the Armageddon equipping depot and buy a Kevlar jacket thinking that's going to do something for you. It doesn't matter what you wear on the outside. He's talking about the armor of God, the spiritual armor. And he says, because we fight these things, put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to do what? Withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Meaning you fight your fight and you stay standing. Stand there having girded your waist with truth, putting on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the pre preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench the fiery darts. He lays out the armor of God. He lays out what you and I are to wear in the spirit and in our soul. He lays out the battle plan. He lays out the offensive plan. You and I have got to prepare and fight the fight of faith. Now remember I told you this is a supernatural fight. Let me tell you a story out of Joshua the 6th chapter. Joshua the 6th chapter. Last week we talked about the children of Israel coming to the promised land. There was a man by the name of Joshua and Caleb that went in and spied. And they said that they could do it. But everybody else said that they couldn't. 
Now they find themselves in the promised land and they find themselves in a city with very big walls called Jericho. The presence of God went before them. The people of Jericho were afraid. They weren't coming in or out of this city. They were locked up in this stronghold. And the Lord speaks to Joshua and he tells him, here's how you're going to fight this battle. You're not going to go and get ladders or throw grappling hooks and climb the walls. You're not going to go burn the gates down so that you can get in through the gates like all the things that you see in the medieval times. You're not going to do that. Here's what you're going to do. You want to know what you're going to do, Joshua? Joshua says, yes, I do. He says, all right, six days, every day, walk around the city and don't say anything. Let the priests blow their horns and carry the Ark of the Covenant. And you walk around the city in silence. People at Jericho are thinking, what is going on with these guys walking around our city? He says, on the seventh day, get up early. Walk around the city seven times. And on the seventh time, the priests blow their horns. And when the priests blow their horns, you tell the army to shout. And you tell them to shout like they haven't shouted before. And the walls will come down. It's a supernatural fight. So Joshua and the children of Israel do exactly as God has described. They walk around the city of Jericho in silence. They walk in silence and they just march. They just march. What are we doing here? Why are we doing this? This isn't how you fight a battle. What are we doing? Why are we walking around this city? And on the seventh day, after the seventh time, when they lay a shout, the Bible tells us that the walls of Jericho came down. And they ran into the city and they took the city with the power of God. Your intellect is going to say, hey, guess what? I can't do this. I don't know what I'm putting all my eggs in this basket for. I can't even see the basket. But it's a fight of faith. It's a fight of faith and you're putting your faith into something that you can't see, which means that you're going to get results that you can't even imagine. Why? Because God is on your side. It's a supernatural battle. Secondly, how do we fight this fight? Number two, we fight in word. It's a vocal battle. The Bible tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue. What you say can greatly affect the outcome of the battle. Did you know in military, they have these things called propaganda? You ever heard that word before, propaganda? And what they do is on both sides... They, th they say things like, you'll never win, you can't beat us. Oh, the Americans there in World War II, they had well, uh, the Tokyo Rose. Oh, you guys, you can't get us. Oh, we're too strong. And they would try to demeanor, diminish, diminish, excuse me, the American morale. What you say can greatly affect the outcome of your fight. It's a vocal battle. It's a vocal battle. You've got to start using your mouth and your words wisely. You with me tonight? Yeah. It's a vocal battle. Did you know Satan can't read your thoughts? What? God's the only omniscient person. God's the on, only omnipotent. Meaning God is the only one that can be everywhere at once and see everything at once. Everything, everything, everything that was created by God is bound by the powers of God. You know what that means? It's a vocal battle. You're out there casting the devil out of your life in your mind. The devil's looking at you trying to figure out what the heck you're saying. Because you're sitting there in your prayer closet going. <laughs> you got to speak it. You got to speak it. You got to speak it. You got to say it. And you got to say it like you mean it. Let me tell you something. If it's good enough for Jesus, then I'll tell you what, it's good enough for me. And when Jesus was in the wilderness, Matthew, the fourth chapter, I'm going to put verse number four, verse number seven, and verse number ten. You want to know how to fight a spiritual fight? You speak it out loud. So the world and the devil can hear you. And what do you speak? What do I speak? Pastor Luke, what do we speak out loud? Do I just talk? No, 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 no. You want to know what to speak? Speak the word. Let me show it to you. Matthew, the, Matthew, the fourth chapter, verse number four, verse number seven, verse number ten. The devil tries to defeat the, 
tries to tempt Jesus. And Jesus, verse number four says, he answered, it is written. Verse number seven, what else does Jesus say? The devil tries to tempt Jesus. Jesus says to him, verse number seven, it is written. Verse number 10, the devil tries to tempt him again. Away with you, Satan, for it is written. What do we speak? The word of God. You speak the word. You speak the word. Don't let that sickness take hold of you. Remember we said life and death are in the power of the tongue? You got to watch what you say. Well, you know, I got a cold. I have a cold. Do you know what you just said? I possess a cold. I have the flu. I possess what the devil has given me. I have cancer. I accept and I am, I have, that's an that's ownership statement. You need to watch the words of your mouth. And what do you speak? Do you speak what you possess? Or do you speak what the word of God says? And the word of God says, it is written that by the stripes of Jesus Christ, I am healed. It is written that God wants to bless his people. It is written that if God be for us, then who can be against us? And you speak it. Say it. Let him know. Let the world know. This is a fight. And until we, the church, get serious about it, and stop patty caking around and call it religion, when we get serious about this and we start fighting for what we believe, start fighting for who we are, and start fighting in the name of Jesus Christ, we're not going to see results. I got to stop. But let me say this. I remember I was in Peru in a city called Santa Rosa. We had a crusade. We were praying for people there. I've used this example twice, I think, before. But you need to hear it again. We were praying for people, for healing. We just coming up and saying, in the name of Jesus, they'd have cataracts or they'd have tumors. In the name of Jesus, by the stripes of Jesus, well, you're healed, be healed, be healed. And we would just sit there and pray and believe and wait. And I remember the, the evangelist came and he was listening to us pray, the group of teenagers at the time. What are you doing, he said to us. What are you doing? Oh, we're, we're praying for healing. What else are we doing? You saw us, we're laying hands on them. He said, you need to speak to it. What is it that you have? What is, you got cataracts? You got a tumor? You got cancer? You start speaking to it. We lay hands on them. In the name of Jesus, blindness, get out of them. You have your sight received. In the name of Jesus, tumor, get out of here. And I, I, listen, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. I am not kidding you. We would put our hands on tumors, and we would take them off, and they would not be there. We would put our hands on people's eyes, and we would take them off, and they would be clear. You speak to it. Speak to it. Speak to it. If it's sickness, if it's disease, if it's infirmities, if it's, if it's a, a spiritual attacks, you speak to it in the name of Jesus, you foul, rotten little devil. Get out of here. I remember our good friend Diego Mesa was talking about his battle with cancer. And he said, if anything, he learned how to cuss at the devil. Now, he wasn't using the real cuss words. He was using the devil. You foul mouth, ugly snot face looking puke looking devil you get and he would start to tell the devil what he thought of him and tell him to get out of his body you start speaking proclaim it last one tonight oh my goodness I have to go last one tonight we fight this fight in life it's a sentient battle oh huh? big word that's like a that's a two dollar word it's not a five dollar word it's not a 50 cent word it's, it's you kind of like what does that mean what does that mean? It's a sentient battle. It simply, this means this. Sentient means just this. The ability to perceive and to feel. To perceive and to feel. Do you have feeling? Can you tell when something's going on? You're a sentient being. That sounds kind of like out of this world, doesn't it? I'm a sentient being. You can go to work tomorrow. Hey, did you know that I'm a sentient being? It's a fight of life. James in the fourth chapter, I'll put these up on the overhead, says, therefore, submit to God. Why? Therefore, meaning God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. We want to be humble. Submit to God in our humility. Resist the devil and he will flee. First Peter 5, chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 9, 
says, resist him, speaking of the devil who walks around like a roaring lion. Resist him in steadfast in faith, steadfast in faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. You and I have got to live this in our life, not just speak it, not just uh, think it in our faith, but to live it. How do you and I resist the devil? By position. By position. Did you know position in a fight is the determining the factor? The military, you want to have the high ground? In a, in, a, in, a, in a boxing match or in a, in, a, in a wrestling match or anything of that nature, you don't want to find yourself backed against the ropes or in the corner. You want to be the person backing somebody else into the corner. That's why you've heard the term backed into a corner. Position. You have got to position your life so that you can resist the devil. What does that mean? That means that you don't hang out with the people that you once hung out with. That means that you don't go to the places that you once went to. That means that you don't drink the drinks that you once drank. It means that you don't say the words that you once said. It means that you don't think the thoughts that you once thought. It means that you don't do the things that you once did. Why? Because by position, you are saying, no longer, devil, am I finding myself in that place, but now I'm going to go where God has me. So many times we wonder, why can't I get out of this? When we get saved, we go to church and then we go right back to our friends in the world and wonder, why are we not making any progress? Why is the devil beating the snot out of me? Why am I not blessed? Because you need to position yourself for victory rather than for defeat. Edmund Burke said this, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. All that is necessary for the devil to win is for you to position yourself to not fight. If he can get you to believe that you can't win, if he can get you to believe that it's not worth it, if he can get you to believe that you're too tired, that you're too worn out, that the results all get to heaven either way, what does it matter? If he can get you to live a mediocre life or to not show up for the fight at all, you have already lost. And all that you have got to do for the devil to win is to sit back and do nothing. But the, the victory is already ours. The devil is already defeated, fighting from a position of desperation and defeat. And now all you and I have got to do is realize that all we have got to keep doing is press on, press on, press on. And we will see, listen, we will see our city. We will see our inland empire saved. We will see San Bernardino like we prayed in our staff meeting today. No longer be called the armpit of the inland empire, but rather the revival epicenter of the world. Why? Because we will fight. Don't sit back and watch from the bleachers. Get in on it. Get in on the dog pile. Think about it like this. Let's dog pile Satan. Dog pile the devil because he is defeated. All you and I have got to do is understand that we fight the battle, but Jesus Christ is on our side. That Jesus Christ has already won. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. The battle is not ours, but it is God's. And all we have to do is realize that today. How do we fight this fate? We fit this, how do we fight this fight? We fight it in faith. We fight it in voice. We fight it in life. Did you guys get something out of that tonight? <laughs> Praise God. God is good, amen? Let me do something. Let me ask you a question really quick. I'll let you out in just a couple of more minutes, I promise. But let me give you the opportunity to examine your heart and your life and where you stand with God. You know, we talked about fighting the battle and fighting the spiritual fight. Sometimes we wonder, why are we not effective? Well, you know, you've got to have God on your side in order to be effective in that. There was a story in the, in, the, in the book of Acts where people were casting out or attempting to cast out demons in the name of Jesus whom Paul preached. They didn't know who God was and they found themselves very ineffective in their spiritual fight because they did not have a relationship and know the source of the authority, that is Jesus Christ. So let me ask you this question. If you were to leave this place today and you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? The answer to that leads to your ultimate do you, ultimate question is, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And you say, well, Pastor Luke, I think I get to heaven. Did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can think, hope, or wish your way into heaven? You can't get there because you want to or because you hope so. You say, Pastor Luke, I don't know that heaven or hell exists. 
you know what? It doesn't matter if you don't know or don't believe if it exists. It's real. And don't you know that the devil's out there trying to get you to buy the lie that it's not real so that he can get you? We talked about that today. If he can get your mind, he'll get your soul. And listen, I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough today to tell you the truth. Heaven is a real place. Hell is a real place. It was never designed for people, but God gives us the choice whether we're going to go to one or the other. We've just got to make that choice. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, I wasn't born as a, uh, or raised as a Buddhist, a Hindu, or as a Muslim, or any other type of world religion. So I always thought that by default or by classification, that means I'm going to get into heaven. Do you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your parents told you you were a Christian, you're going to get into heaven? Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you were baptized or christened as a baby because you attended Sunday school or Sabbath school classes mean that you're going to get to heaven? Did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you go to church now because you've given yourself the title of Christian means you're going to find yourself in heaven? Did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you wear religious jewelry or religious clothing or have a Jesus tattooed somewhere on your body does it mean that you're going to get into heaven? Nowhere will you find that. Ain't going to get to heaven that way. You might say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, I always thought that good people go to heaven. I've, I've never robbed the 7-Eleven. I've never done bad things. I've done more good in my life than bad. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get to heaven? Did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that good people get to heaven? As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds according to God's righteousness are like filthy rags. Nothing we could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get to heaven. Why? Because that's not how we do that. That's not how we get there. You see, it's God's heaven, it's God's way. The only way you and I can get there is God's way. You can't get to heaven because you're a servant, or you're a volunteer at a church, you served in the children's or youth ministry, or you carried the pastor's Bible, or you were an usher. Because you're in church today, you're not going to get to heaven there. No, nowhere, nowhere in the Bible does it say that you get to heaven because you served. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to heaven because you know the scripture, because you know who Jesus is, you have a, a mental knowledge of who God is. The Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who God is, yet they're not finding themselves in heaven. The devil quoted scriptures to Jesus. Ain't going to find himself in heaven. You're not going to get to heaven because you know who God is. Jesus was having a conversation with a religious leader of his day, and he laid out the plan on how to get to heaven forever and ever and ever. And he said this. He said, you must be born again. Oh, Pastor Luke, I've heard that word before. I've heard that term uh, that makes me think of Hollywood or popular culture. It always makes it out to be weird. You know, those, those uncomfortable Christianity and that kind of out of control. And let me tell you something. I don't care what Hollywood or popular cultures made of that word from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Born again has always meant the same thing. It means this, that you've given God, listen, all of your heart and all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. God's not after some mental ascent towards him. He's not after your carnal knowledge of who he is. He's not after a token prayer or an occasional uh, memorization of the Bible. He's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. Let me prove it to you in the Bible. In the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church. Hey, people like you and I gather together doing good things in the name of God. And he says, I know your works. When I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold, he says. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean in terms of your relationship with Jesus Christ? Let me define it to you like this. You're a little bit in, you're a little bit out of the relationship. You're a little bit up and you're a little bit down. You're floating around kind of ping pong and back and forth, in and out. Occasional church attendance, token prayer every once and again doing your own thing, doing some of God's thing, you're riding the fence. And Jesus Christ says, if that's you, you are deceived in thinking you're going to make it into heaven. So then how do we get there? Can't get there your way. Can't get to heaven my way or some well-meaning church committee or author's way. The only way you and I can find ourselves in heaven with God forever and ever and ever and ever is God's way. And Jesus Christ said this. He said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one goes to the Father except through him. You can't find it in good deeds. You can't find it in philosophy. You can't find it in science. The only way you can find it is through Jesus Christ. How do we do this? In a moment, I want to give you the opportunity. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. In just a moment, I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. Smack my hand on the Bible just like that, real loud. And I want to give you the opportunity in just a moment to make sure you get into heaven in this place. And what I want you to do when I smack my hand on the Bible is I want you to pop your hand up. And what you're doing by the raising of your hand, we'll do it all together at the same time. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to give him all of my heart. I want to give God all of my life. Pastor Luke, I want to make sure I get into heaven. I want to be a Christian. I want to leave hell behind. I'll see your hand. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down, and then we'll pray together after that. 
You say, Pastor, look, I don't think I can raise my hand. I'm going to be embarrassed. You know what? You might be embarrassed. That's true. Somebody might see you. The person that you came with might know. But let me tell you something. Wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't go forward for God? The reality is, as Jesus said, that if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his father. But if you deny him before men, he'll deny you before his father. You see, God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way in. The only way you can do it is by choosing him. He's already done everything he could to ensure you get to heaven by giving for your sins Jesus Christ to die a beaten, bloody mess on the cross, a spectacle for the world to see. And in return, he wants all of your heart. He wants all of your life. The decision's yours. Who should raise their hands if you've never given them all your heart? If you've never given them all your life in just a moment, if that's you, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. Who should raise their hands if you're not sure? Maybe you did this at a Billy Graham crusade or a Harvest crusade or on TV, but you never really followed through with it. Today, get your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. Don't leave tonight without making sure that you're uh, going to find yourself in heaven with God forever and ever and ever. Finally, who should raise their hands? Today, if you've been living lukewarm, running from God instead of to God, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, today let's make it the day you go hot in your relationship for Jesus Christ and you go all in and you make him the Lord and Savior of your life. Pop your hand up all, all at the same time together on the count of three. We'll do it. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. And we'll go forward from God. The decision's yours. Today is a day of your salvation. Don't let it pass you by. Get ready. If that's you in this place. I'm going to count to three. Get ready. If that's you watching by television online, pop your hand up wherever you're at. If you're watching in the foyer or wherever you're at, get ready. If this is you in this place, come on, don't miss out on your opportunity. I'm going to count. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in the house today. Where are you at in this place today? I see you. One, two. I see you. Three. I see you. Three wise people. I see you guys. I see you. Anybody else? I see hands over here. Four, five. I see you. Six, seven. I see you. Seven wise people. In the family rooms, I, I see those two back there. Seven wise people. I see a hand, I see people flagging over here. Where are you at? Give me a little wave so I can see your hand. I saw you already. I got you. Seven wise people. Eight, I see you right there in the front. I see you guys. Eight wise people. Anybody else in this place? In the family rooms, wherever you're at. Come on, get your hands up so I can see it. Anybody else? Just say, man, I wonder if I should. Come on. Today is the day of your salvation. Don't let this moment pass you by. If that's you, get your hand up so I can see it. Anybody else? Eight wise people. I didn't embarrass them. I'm not going to embarrass you. Anybody else today? Don't miss this. Hey, don't miss this. Today is your day. Anybody else? Anybody else today? Well, praise God for eight wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do. For the eight of you that raised your hand for number nine, number 10, number 11, number 12, number 13, number 14, number 15, that didn't raise your hand. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You said, I want to give him my heart and my life. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be the personal Lord and Savior of your life. And we want to do that. We want to pray with you. So in a moment, what we're going to do is we're going to sing a song. We're all going to stand up in just a moment. And if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, I want you to be bold. You said you were going to give him all your heart. You said you were going to give him all your life. And I want you to be bold. Grab your, your, your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible. A friend, if you need a friend, somebody that came with you. Grab whatever you came with and get out of your seat, get out of your chair, get into the aisle and come and meet me here at the altar and let's change destinies together. So let's all stand. Please, nobody leave at this time. And if you raise your hand, you can come from the front, from the back, from the family room, wherever you're at, you're at. Come on. You can come. You can come. Come on. You come on. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. You can come. Come on, if that's you. You come. Come on. You can come. Hey guys, listen, here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is going to do three things with you, okay? Three easy things. Number one, he's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life, okay? Second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you some free things. For free literature, a book that our senior pastor wrote called Welcome to Your Destiny. You get saved and you wonder, now what do I do? We want to help you with that, get you some resources to help you out with that. The third thing he's going to do is he's going to give you a friend. We give away friends here at The Rock. We call them spiritual personal trainers or SPTs. You know, you go to the gym, you see personal trainers, they 
help you get strong, make sure you don't waste your time on the gym and make sure you get your, your money out of your, your membership. Well, we got SBT, somebody that'll meet with you right before service to buy you a cup of coffee, teach you some things about the Word of God for five weeks to get you strong so you don't go back to the life that you came from and you go forward in your relationship with God. Hey, and at the end of it, they'll even give you a really cool rock Bible, really nice one with, look, I mean, that's, that's the Bible you'll get right there. Just because we believe in you and we know that God's going to do something great in my life. So if you guys would just go right over there with Pastor Joel.